and just pause for questions, okay? Yes? Well, so, so if you think, think of a neuron, it has um, one part that kind of receives an input and another part that sends an output signal, <coughs> right? And so um, there are some neurons where the, either the output signal or the input signal is connected to like, so, so it could be that the input signal is connected to like your eye or your ear, right? So something that happens outside is going to, trigger that neuron to send an output somewhere in the brain, right? So there's, there's a connection to the outside world there, right? Alternatively, you have neurons that have an input signal in the brain and the output signal is like with your muscle, that'll tell your muscle to do this or do that, right? And so there's another sort of connection to the outside world where the, the input is in the brain but the output is out in the world. But there's other neurons where the input is in the brain and the output is also in the brain. So they don't have any connection to, they don't have a direct connection in themselves in that particular neuron to anything that's next to the world. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so there's a relatively large number of those types of neurons that, are, that have their input and their output inside the brain. Yeah? Okay. So, um, yes? Uh, so, so, so I, uh, um, I misspoke if I, if I said that they're, they're, those are neurons that humans don't use. Um, they're still neurons that are used, it's just that they're used in a different way. They don't, they don't have a direct input or output into the world. Rather, they're, they're, do, they're doing something else. We haven't, I haven't gotten to the sort of details of what they're doing, right? But, uh, but somehow they're doing some kind of input out there. They're, they're, they're doing some kind of processing inside the brain. Um, that doesn't have, right, th where the direct consequence is not with something in the world, either a sensory input or, or a motor output. So they're not just wasted in the brain. They're not wasted in the brain, yeah. <laughs> so, so, but the, the, the point is that, though, is that uh, th we have to figure out what it is they're doing to understand why they're not wasted, right? Uh, and that's what we're going to get to. But so, so in a, so, so you know, if, if our brain were in, you know, the, you know the, in, a, in a sort of chimpanzee body and, and the chimpanzees just function the way ch chimpanzees do function today, then that, it would be wasted. There would be no use for those neurons. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to get to, well, what exactly are they doing in the human brain, right? Okay. So, other questions? All right. So how does the brain develop in a way that requires the least possible amount of genetically pre-programmed information according to Deacon? Can we answer that? Yes? What was your name again? Uh, Alden. Alden, okay. Um, so this particular question is about what's pre-programmed in the brain. And there's relatively little in terms of, the, uh, of, of how the neurons are organized or pre that is pre-programmed. And the reason for that is how does the brain develop if it doesn't know what to do in advance? It's because it produces so many more neurons than it needs and that only those neurons that end up being used then survive and the other ones die off, right? So, you know, like, like he said, like he, he, gave this, he gave this example, it's like, it's like building a door by first building a whole wall and then later on cutting out the hole for the door, right? Because in that way, you can build your wall without even having any idea where you're going to have the door and then later on when you say, oh, this is the good place for the door, then you cut the door out. And that's kind of how the brain um, structures itself. It builds all these neurons and then it just kind of, you know, kills off the neurons it doesn't need and it leaves the ones that, that are useful. Right? And so that's how it can, and it, it, and it does it in the development of the organism itself, right? So as the organism is, de is developing and is receiving inputs from 
you know, from the world and from other parts of the brain, it's going to be then sculpting itself in the way it needs to be to, to respond to those inputs. Yeah? Okay. So how do brains adapt to the particular body to which they are matched according to Deacon? So it's basically the same same answer to this, except that you know, what, 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 you know, what we're talking about is that the particular body is going to have you know, particular types of inputs. So you know, like I said, if, 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 if an animal is born without a limb, then there obviously won't be inputs from that limb, and the neurons that normally would have been recruited um, to serve that limb will be used for something else. Right? Okay. And, and what kinds of neurons predominate in the human brain, and what effect does this have on human brain development, according to Deacon? Somebody answer that? <coughs> yes, um, Scott. Um, they're like internal and they're not connected to the outside world, so the prefrontal cortex. Great, yes. So um, prefrontal cortex neurons predominate, they're not connected to the outside world, and the the effect on human brain development is to somehow give more kind of voting choice, is what he calls it, or, or more, more influence to these neurons that don't have a direct connection to the outside world. 